Steve, it's great to see you today. It's great to be with you. Steve, let me ask you, you've got a lot of experience in American politics, having worked in the campaigns of people like Arnold Schwarzenegger, George W. Bush, and with John McCain's campaign for president. But you later started the Lincoln Project, specifically to oppose Donald Trump, a Republican. What's going on right now in the U.S.? What are these elections, which we're about to have, about? What are Americans most concerned by? Well, it's a very complicated question. Um, more than 160 million people will turn out, will participate in this election. This is the 60th quadrennial American presidential election taking place in the 248th year of our independence. Population of the country is 340 million, which means we're very near the mark where out of the 700 million Americans that, that have ever been, that about half who have ever lived are alive right now. And so we're having a big debate. There is a, an existential question on the table. Abraham Lincoln talked about this, uh, the longevity of the republic, of the country, of the fact that we really face and never have any danger from an outside conquering force, that our danger is the danger of national suicide. And so we have a question at a momentous moment in history that's before us, and we have a great privilege as Americans in being able to decide it because it affects free people all over the world. And so the first thing that this election is about is what Franklin Roosevelt and the Canadian prime minister talked about late into the evening in the White House in the middle of the Second World War when the end was in sight. And Franklin Roosevelt was talking about the American-led era that would emerge after the war, his dreams of the collective security agreements, his ideas about decolonialization, about the self-determination of nations for people all over the world to be able to enjoy freedom of speech everywhere, freedom of religion everywhere, freedom from want, freedom from fear. And as he was laying out this vision, Mackenzie King, the prime minister, recalled that he said that this vision, that it was his hope that it would endure for as long as everybody who was alive on the day the war was won, was still alive. And those people, the youngest of them, are 79. And he observed that nothing lasts forever. So I brought some visual aids for our for our talk today that I'm gonna that I'm gonna show. And the first one is this is this Life magazine um, from 1939. Uh, of the Statue of Liberty, and it poses a question through a statement uh, that is perpetual, America's future. And what I would say to everybody listening is there's different ways to wire a lamp or a house. You can start a car with a key, but you can short circuit that process without a key and ignite the engine and make the car go. If we are a car in this analogy, our engine is our election. And there's no way to make the American car go absent an acceptance of the core foundational premise of the country, which is that we, the people, decide who gets power for a temporary 
amount of time with great restraints. It doesn't work where a leader born or self-declared or even elected gets to tell us under the terms we live under their whims and rules. It's foundational to the country. And so what's at stake, long-winded answer, is the American way of life. That's what's at stake in this election. So all of the issues that the pollster will tell you that this election may be about are not what the election is about. What the election is about is something very, very, very big. A fascist named Donald Trump has, with the complicity of the elected leadership of one of America's two great political parties, this one, the third oldest in the world, one of the world's most important institutions for the advancement of human freedom and dignity, the institution that elected Abraham Lincoln to the White House and ended slavery and rebuilt the Union and stared down the Soviets in the Cold War has been captured by malevolence that has long reigned in America, that's always been there, but until 2016, had never taken executive power. And so we saw Madison Square Garden, a fascist who supports the world's dictators, detests the values that unite free people from Kiev to Warsaw to Berlin to London to Ottawa to Washington, D.C. So, Steve, let's imagine a scenario where the Democrats take the White House and a scenario where the Republicans take the White House. What does it mean for Ukraine, do you think? And for that, very clearly, you don't support Trump. But there are a lot of people who do support Trump and support Ukraine. What would you tell them? Well, so there are um, a couple of things uh, to consider on the on the question of of Ukraine, um, Kamala Harris, like every president, uh, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, Obama, supports the NATO alliance, which keeps us safe. It's the most powerful military alliance in world history. And Donald Trump, because he's a stupid person, and I mean this, you can't fix stupid, thinks it makes us weaker, which is a rejection of the idea that was built by geniuses like George Marshall. There would be no action that could conceivably make America less secure in the world than the abandonment of our allies and the structures which we built and benefit all of mankind, but no people more so than us from a naked self-interested perspective. Vladimir Putin, unlike Trump, is not stupid. And he's not Donald Trump's friend. And Vladimir Putin holds Donald Trump in contempt and understands that Donald Trump fetishizes him. Vladimir Putin understands American politics. And that's why there's so many campaigns aimed at dividing American society that originate in Russia. Electronic campaigns, misinformation campaigns. So Vladimir Putin 
is rooting hard for the force in American life that will give him a permission structure to do what he wants to do in Ukraine and then in Moldova and then in the Baltics. And when you look at this war and you look at the stakes for Russia now with nearing a million casualties, the only thing that we can do to keep peace in the world is to make sure the Ukrainians are in a position to kill the invaders of their homeland who have come and raped the women and murdered babies and kidnapped children. And so this moment requires Americans to recognize the interconnectedness of the world and the interconnectedness of values. So I'm, I'm gonna show you my second visual aid to demonstrate what, what Vladimir Putin is and the question at hand, right? This is from 1940. America was not yet in the war, but this is precisely what Vladimir Putin and Russia is. It is an aggressive, assertive, fascistic power that has invaded a sovereign neighbor and has sought to eradicate a people, to say they don't exist, that there's only a superior race, a superior language, Russia, and as Putin seeks to rebuild this empire, it will be an empire of death, an empire of blood, that sows chaos in the world and spreads death to Europe and ultimately to America. So this is a pivotal moment. We are at the edge of lived history. We are seeing a cycle repeat itself because for a long season in Europe, after the near destruction of 2000 years of civilization, generations of Russians and Germans and English and French and Italians and Americans said, never again. But that only holds for as long as the people who experience those events can comprehend them. So when you go to a bar in Warsaw and you see people like us, our age, who've lost everything, right? They weren't peasant farmers in a village pre-World War II, right? They were, they were, they were musicians and they were bankers and they were lawyers and nurses but because they engaged in a political protest, they faced long prison sentences and they had to leave Russia. They had to leave Belarus. And now they live in exile. So the American mind has a really hard time imagining catastrophe because it really hasn't touched America in the way that it's touched Ukraine, in the way that it's touched Poland, where these events are a lot more vivid. So the stakes in this election for the freedom of the world, for the peace of the world, for the people of Ukraine are obviously enormous. The American people don't want to see Donald Trump capitulate Ukraine to Russia, but at the same time, Donald Trump will be unrestrained in the office of president should he win and he will be a vessel that does great damage to Ukraine, to the Western Alliance, to the peace of the world, because he's a sucker, he's a clown, he's a weakling, he's a narcissist, he's arrogant, and the combination of arrogance and stupidity is lethal in the real world. So, Steve, as you observed, 
the Republicans historically did support NATO. And in fact, they were known to be quite outspoken against the Soviet Union. Most notably, we all recall Ronald Reagan's very passionate support for freedom globally. And later, you work with Senator John McCain. His own views about Vladimir Putin and Russia are quite well known. So what's taken hold of today's Republican Party? Conservatism left its mainstream moorings, became detached from fundamental values, right? When we talk about conservatism, we don't mean revanchist. What we mean in America is the conservation and the preservation of the American Constitution. It's a, it's a political philosophy that says slow down that says, be careful, that looks at human nature with, in my view, appropriate skepticism, but is not always correct, can be fallible, because sometimes when you look at social progress, for example, the civil rights movement, you can't delay the reckoning with justice, right? So these opposing forces of liberalism and conservatism bound together in a mutual fidelity to the American Constitution, to the revolutionary principles of the, of the country, worked and arranged harmoniously because they were entwined with a belief in pluralistic political freedom that emerged after World War II. Now, there have always been periods of illiberalism in America, of racism, of nativism. You had the John Birchers in the 1950s. You had a lot of paranoia in the 1950s, the McCarthy era. But in the end, the institutions held. And what they held to was a devotion to the principles of the American Republic. What has happened is Donald Trump emerged at a time when trust has collapsed for a lot of meritorious reasons between the American citizen and right, well, every institution you can think to imagine from media on down, a world-class demagogue rose and the accumulation of events with a mix of drift in the current, opportunism and magical alchemy, what came out of it and what it has blossomed into and matured into is a legitimate fascist political movement that doesn't believe in democratic values, but rather social hierarchy, that doesn't celebrate the power of the individual, but rather the collective, that subordinates the human to the interest of the movement in the state that defines truth as wholly variable, entirely subjective, and completely dependent on what the leader tells you it is. So we've reached a moment where every warning, every prophecy, where every question about could that happen here has been answered. It could happen here. It is happening here. And the question now is whether it will be stopped. Regardless, regardless, of the outcome of the election, the country will be in a constitutional crisis because Donald Trump has shattered the norms. The system is dependent on norms. The fundamental norm, the crown jewels, is the idea that in a democratic system, if you're involved in it, that you're prepared to lose an election because you recognize with deep humility, that your ego must be subordinate to the sovereign, which in America 
He's not an emperor, not a Caesar, not a tyrant, not a king. It's the people. So, Steve, let me ask you one last question. Going ahead, let's imagine a scenario where the Republicans take the House, the Senate, and the White House. What would that look like for Ukraine? What is the mind of the Republican Party today if it had the ability to do what it wanted without restraints with Ukraine? I think that there is a lack of willingness, moral, intellectual, to oppose Donald Trump within the Republican Party. So Ukraine will have imposed on it a peace um, that maximizes Russia's uh, most ambitious aims. And that will be imposed at the price of cutting off the arms that are necessary to fight. Um, Ukraine will never be a member of NATO. Um, and Moldova will be the next country to fall. And Donald Trump will make vulnerable the Baltics. And the Chinese will watch this carefully and not for nothing. Um, there are now 10,000 North Korean troops moving towards Ukraine on Russian soil. Uh, this is not a European war any longer. Um, what you see are the tentacles forming, connecting, metastasizing in a way that set the conditions for world war. And what that means is not a cartoonized version of the Second World War. What it means is an interconnected geopolitical kinetic military fight uh, for global domination uh, because these countries seek to topple the current global order which emerged from the last global war. And whether we recognize it or not, these countries are waging a form of war against all of our nations. And that war is being waged from Moscow, from Pyongyang, and from Tehran. It's connected, it's lethal, it's a threat, it's dangerous, and in an ideal circumstance, you want leaders with the capacity to see the dangers that the country faces. Donald Trump is too dumb to see it. Steve, that was quite sobering. I appreciate your time today. Thank you.